So welcome everyone to the annual Betty and Shmuel Rosencrantz oration. I'd like to welcome our elders, um, Holocaust survivors who have come to be with us tonight. The, welcome the dignitaries um, that Geron has mentioned and also our various Jewish community leaders who have come tonight. Thank you all for coming. I'd also like to welcome our special guest, uh, Dr. Stephen Smith from uh, the Executive Di Director of the Shoah Foundation, the USC Shoah Foundation, and also Lee Lieberman, who's the Chair of the Board of Councillors of the Shoah Foundation. I don't know if people know here, but the, uh, Lee Lieberman, who is a Melbourne woman, has now become the Chair of the uh, uh, Shoah Foundation Board of Councillors. So that's a, a wonderful thing for a, someone from Melbourne to have that connection. I welcome the Jewish Holocaust Centre co-presidents, Pauline Rockman, OAM, and Sue Hampel, OAM, and um, the chair of the Jewish Holocaust Centre Foundation, Helen Mayamoff, and other Jewish Holocaust Centre board members who are here tonight. And welcome to all our supporters, our donors, volunteers, special friends. Welcome to you all. We love and thank the um, work that you do for us. And welcome, of course, to the Goldman and Rosencrantz families who enable us to have this special event every year and, and enables us to have a fantastic speaker come and talk to us about something important in the world of Holocaust education. And it's free, which is a wonderful thing too. So thank you for your support. And also a special thanks this year to Leon Goldman and family for their special endowment, which has enabled us to set up the Judy and Leon Goldman Holocaust, Centre for Holocaust Education, which is a fantastic initiative. <laughs> it's uh, the largest endowment we've, we've received, and it will enable us to continue to further develop and enhance the educational offerings that we currently have, you know, looking well into the future and making sure we can do this work in perpetuity, which is absolutely vital, so thank you. Um, as many of you know, we have embarked on a capital campaign to create a centre for the future, so thanks to all of you who have supported us thus far, and um, we're very excited about where we're going, uh, which starts next year. So, I want to tell you a story. Do you want to hear a story? Of course, you, everyone wants to hear a story. But actually, I'm lying. I'm going to talk about stories. Um, I'm going to talk about why stories are so important. It's, I, I read somewhere that stories are more important for human evolution than opposable thumbs. Because opposable thumbs taught, taught us to hang on, but stories tell us what to hang on to. And stories connect us all, as Garen was just referring to. They enable us to reach across that which divides us. They are fantastic within communities. They bind communities together with shared stories. But they also are so important for society because disparate and different communities can have uh, a connection through empathising with different stories and how they can connect with us all. So at the Jewish Holocaust Centre, we tell stories every day. And at the end of the day, you walk past the message board from the school's students who visited, and invariably you will find at least one, if not many, variations of thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. And thank you for having the courage to share your story with us. And um, so we at the museum, we're collecting, we're preserving, we're sharing stories. The Shoah Foundation, and you'll hear from Stephen shortly, um, is an institution that's collected tens of thousands of stories, and not just of Holocaust survivors, but um, other, across other genocides and atrocities as well. We're here, we gather for the Rosencrantz oration every year around as close as possible to the events of Kristallnacht, because 
Those of you who knew Shmuel Rosencrantz knew that um, the story he would tell, the story that I wouldn't say he loved to tell, but it, he felt he had to share, was the story of what happened to him on the night of Kristallnacht. And it's a story that really came to define him. Um, and, and Shmuel, who was our past president and was a doyen of the Jewish community, um, this was the story he would tell every year. And he, he spoke about how he, as a teenager, with his father, fled, they were living in Vienna, and fled to the hills and watched from the hills of Vienna as, as Vienna burned, as the pogroms were happening, and how he cried uh, seeing the smoke from the synagogues. Um, and that story, um, like for me, and I'm sure for a lot of other people, it took what's in the history books about Kristallnacht, the event, and it makes, it makes it personal because you can kind of, I mean, I, can never, I could never really understand what it was like to be there, but um, I could sort of start to imagine being in a town, your hometown, and being hunted. And um, it just, it, it was a way into the events that make it, I guess, so much more memorable. You know, I, I just cannot forget when Shmuel would tell us that story over and over again. Um, something else extraordinary that happened around Kristallnacht, which we talk about year in, year out, and Geron just referred to it, is the actions of William Cooper and the um, Australian Aborigines League. In the month after Kristallnacht, they um, wrote a petition and marched to the consul, the German consul, to present this letter of protest about the treatment of the Jews in Germany. Um, and it's just, for us, it's obviously a powerful story about someone standing up on behalf of the Jewish community and someone who in his own lands was not, was deprived of citizenship, was a persecuted minority. And so obviously we think about that and I always wonder why, why did William Cooper do that? And obviously we know that um, he had that empathy through the shared experience of understanding what it would be like to be a persecuted minority being denied citizenship. That's, that's one reason that's very obvious that why he took that act. Still, he could have not done it, but we honour him because he did it. But the, the other reason when I was um, sort of learning more about William Cooper, there's a, another thing that resonated with me or made me think, um, as a younger man, he was educated, uh, he, he became a Christian, and he was under the influence of a missionary called Daniel Matthews. And Daniel Matthews encouraged the Aboriginal students um, to relate to uh, the story of Exodus and to relate as Aborigines to um, the Israelites in the story of Exodus. And, and this is a story that we tell and retell as Jewish people every year at Passover. And I, I mean, there's a couple of things that, that I think about, but one is that, you know, as Indigenous people, they're very familiar with the concept of having stories handed down generation to generation. And, and he was the Bible and he was a story. And so when, um, I guess when he read in the newspaper about what was happening to the Jews in Germany, he must have thought, well, these are the descendants of the people of the Israelites from the Exodus story. So of course I can relate to that. You know, there's, this was a story that he was very familiar with. So I guess well, we, when we think about stories, I mean, they, they travel across the globe, they travel across time, and they travel across peoples to connect people to, to people, to human to human. So when the students come to the centre, the, the power of these stories, they, um, they hear survivors from Poland, from France, from Czechoslovakia, from Hungary, um, and the students are so diverse. They, they're coming from such a broad range of, of backgrounds. And what's their connection? It's, it's that human to human. It's, it's the interconnection, the power of these stories. The, the survivors who are standing in front of them, 
80, 90 years old. They're talking about when they were teenagers. And this is, an, this is a point of access for the students. They can relate. So I guess what I want to say is at the Holocaust Museum, we're sharing these stories. We're about to rebuild. Why are we rebuilding? I guess at the core of this, we want to tell more, more stories to more people. We want to preserve more stories, we want to collect more stories, and we want to share them as broadly as possible. Many of you know that we have uh, an amazing survivor, a, a collection of survivor testimonies ourselves. And um, Philip Maisel, who is here right over there, has been collecting these stories for 30 years now. He's uh, 97 years young. Uh, it's an incredible, incredible effort. And um, I'm about to show you a very short presentation using um, clips from some of the testimonies uh, just giving us a bit of an insight into the events of Kristallnacht. It's been put together by our audio-visual producer, Robbie Simons. So, Robbie, um, if you would like to, in honour of Shmuel and his wife, Betty, and, and the, the importance of telling this story every year, we'd just like to share a story about Kristallnacht. Thank you. The, the Germans went, went wild and they were running after people, trying to just hit them. And people were dragged around the ground, over the ground and everything. It was just a complete riot going on and that went on for quite a while. I mean, you know, the reason they call it Kristallnacht is because the glass in the morning was all over the place and when the sun came out, it all was sparkling. But I can remember that my parents used to come home and my brother saying that something's going to happen. Surely enough it happened. My father served in the, worst, in the First World War. He said, I served in the war, they're not going to do anything to me. They had sledgehammers and things like that, like, uh, you know, and, and unbelievable, unbelievable. If you would have seen the synagogue after, you would, uh, you would have said a tornado went through or something like that. It was unbelievable. I walked past where our temple was, our synagogue, and I saw the synagogue was on fire, and there was SR men with guns, and they were escorting, they were escorting 10 or 8, 12 Jews to the police. They smashed our businesses completely, like with this, again with hammers and things, and they, on, and, and they rolled on whatever there was left, they rolled Juden rolled. So many. I mean, I don't know how many, but they arrested a great deal. And I remember that distinctively, although I was only eight.
It's with absolute pleasure that I welcome Dr Stephen Smith for his third visit to Melbourne and I'd also like to add my personal welcome to Lee Liberman and Corey Street from the Shower Foundation. Where do I start to tell you about our keynote speaker? I guess by posing two questions. One, how does the Smith family, with absolutely no connection to the Holocaust, come to start Britain's first dedicated Holocaust Memorial and Education Centre in Nottinghamshire? And secondly, how does a non-Jewish Englishman end up running the Shoah Foundation Institute in Los Angeles? About 15 years ago, at an educators' conference at Yad Vashem, I learned the answer to the first question when I met Stephen and his brother James. They had come to Jerusalem to speak to, about the Aegis Trust, an organisation that the brothers co-founded in 2000 for the prevention of genocide, crimes against humanity and mass atrocities worldwide. I discovered that Stephen was born and raised in Sherwood Forest, but Stephen sees himself as less as a Robin Hood and more of a Billy Elliot. You'll have to read his book to discover the inspiring journey that he and his family took in creating that first Holocaust centre in the UK over 20 years ago. To understand Stephen is to embrace his duality. He's a theologian who evangelises about interactive technology. He immerses himself in the heavy academic pursuit of genocide research, but I hear that he can also be seen riding his scooter through the office. A scholar who holds a UNESCO chair on genocide education, Stephen is also an accomplished baker. As a young man, he started his own bakery in England, which he sold before he created the Beit Shalom Centre and the Kigali Genocide Museum in Rwanda, endeavours that brought him recognition as a member of the Order of the British Empire. In addition, Stephen was the inaugural chairman of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, which runs the National Holocaust Memorial Day in the United Kingdom. He was also one of the first English delegates of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Now that's not all. Stephen has served as a producer on a number of films and new media projects, including Dimensions in Testimony and the VR project The Last Goodbye. Stephen has received the Interfaith Gold Medallion and he holds two honorary doctorates. I think it's pretty obvious how this amazing non-Jewish Englishman ended up at the Shoah Foundation. Since 2009, Stephen has held a position as the Fincy Viterbi Executive Director of the USC Shoah Foundation. And under his direction, the Visual History Archive joins an expanding archive that now includes testimonies from the Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide, the Genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, the Nanjing Massacre, the Guatemalan Genocide, the Cambodian Genocide, the South Sudan Civil War, the Central African Republic conflict, contemporary anti-Semitism, and lately also the Kurds in Iraq. Stephen, we are so honoured that you have travelled all the way to Melbourne, Australia, to deliver tonight's keynote address at the annual Betty and Shmuel Rosencrantz Kristallnacht Oration. We look forward to hearing your talk on the courage to speak, survivor testimony as the final word on the Holocaust. Can you please welcome Stephen to deliver tonight's oration? Uh, good evening, thank you, Sue, and thank you for everybody for being here, and in particular to the Holocaust survivors who are with us this evening. Thank you for being here, thank you for telling your stories, thank you for um, everything that you do to make your past a part of our future. I was um, looking through YouTube uh, for a particular person that I knew had given a very short testimony in 1945, and I was on a 19-minute reel um, that was part of a British movie tone uh, footage that was taken at Bergen-Belsen um, in April 1945. You've all seen the images, actually. The images of the bulldozers pushing the, the bodies into the huge graves. You've seen them on documentaries many times. I had never watched all 19 minutes. I'd only ever seen parts of that footage in different documentaries. And I came across this at about minute 11 and a half. This image of a young woman standing in front of one of those mass graves at Bergen-Belsen. 
So I was watching it and I hear something like this. As she gets ready to talk, you see the microphone. Heute ist der 24. April 1945. Meine Namen ist die Hella Goldstein. So today is the 24th of April 1945. My name is Hella Goldstein. She then spends the next 86 seconds describing the liberation of Bergen Belsen, which had taken place nine days before. And I stop and I realize, hang on a minute, I think I'm looking at the very first audiovisual testimony of the Holocaust. So I went to the Show Foundation's archive, where there are 55,000 testimonies of various people that gave their testimonies, and I typed in Hella Goldstein. And what came up under the name Hella Goldstein was, you see their name found, Hella Goldstein, on the other side here, Helen Collin. Thankfully, about 120 people at the Shoah Foundation over five years who spoke 42 languages indexed the whole archive so that things like original names, maiden names, pseudonyms, all the rest of it could be found in the archive. So I could put in Helen, uh, Hella Goldstein and find Helen Collin. I clicked it, and there was Helen Collin. And I noticed that, as she is, that she gave a testimony of three hours and 19 minutes in Houston, Texas. So I texted my friend at the Houston Holocaust Center and said, um, do you know anybody by the name of Helen Collin? She goes, um, Holocaust survivor? I said, yes, I'm calling you. I called her, she says, oh yeah, she says, I said, hey, is she still alive? She said, Yes, but I think she's in hospice. Let me call you back. She called me back and she said, yes, she was in hospice. She had to get some pain meds. She's at home right now. So I hopped on a plane and went to Houston and sat with her and said, do you remember this? I won't play it for you because of time. I then said to her, um, what was it like for, in fact, let's play, this, let's play this little clip. When you went to the microphone to speak, how did you feel when you stood there? I'll be very honest, I was scared. I was shaken, very, very scared. But I wanted to tell them the horrible thing they did to us. And uh, the, only can, the only way I can tell them is by speaking out. The only way I could tell them was by speaking out. So who's them in this situation? Well, them is this bunch of rogues who was standing right in front of her. We only see the camera perspective of her because it's pointing at her, we see the grave, the cameraman has set this up, so the microphone was there and he was trying to show the devastation of that camp. What he doesn't show at that particular point is who her audience was. Some of the most notorious Nazis who were running that camp until nine days before, who the Nazis had then, cons the, the British had conscripted to then fill, take the corpses and fill the graves. In fact, off camera she said to me, I thought I was going to die. And I said, die? She said, well, yes, because these people were our killers until a week before. So when I look at them and I see, what I'm seeing is the fences and the watchtowers and a group of Nazis. For me, I was risking my life to go and tell that story, but I knew it had to be told. Actually, it was a, something a little bit more interesting that even. You'll see in this picture here on the left-hand side, which is the clip that precedes it, um, you can see there the characters, these are actually the Nazi guards, and they're carrying corpses. And what I figured out when I was with her, that on that particular piece of movie tone footage, prior to her going to the microphone, you hear a young woman screaming, and I didn't know what she was saying, but she's screaming at the SS. It turns out it was Hella Goldstein, 22 years old. And she was screaming at them, be careful with that corpse, that could be my mother. 
And so obviously the, the, the camera person had identified this woman as very feisty, put her in front of the microphone, and now she's speaking for the first time to the world about the Holocaust on camera. Important thing about what we're talking about tonight, I thought I was going to die. Major General Sid Schaffnell. Now, I heard he was going to be in Los Angeles, and I was quite excited to go and hear him speak um, because he was a major general and a Holocaust survivor. And I'd never met a major general Holocaust survivor before. Um, but unfortunately, my calendar didn't work, and I couldn't get to the talk, so I invited him to my home for breakfast instead, and he came one Sunday morning, and we talked, and he told me some of his story, which included the fact um, that at the end of the Second World War, the end of the Holocaust, he was in um, Kaunas, Lithuania. Um, his family had been in the ghetto. Everyone had been murdered. In fact, his father had escaped and then been shot. Um, he was the sole survivor of the family at the age of 10. Um, and he was in a 10 foot by 12, are we, are we imperial or metric here? Or it's, whatever, three meters by four meters um, building. Um, no windows except a little slit above the door and a woman would come in once a day and pass water and a crust of bread to him and this went on for several months when he emerged from the room he was obviously very badly uh, had mal bad malnutrition and had scurvy and so forth um, a 10 year old orphan of the Holocaust at the end of the Cold War Sid Schachnow was the first uniformed officer of the United States Army to land in the Soviet Union to broker a deal between the military powers of the Soviet Union and the United States of America. And um, he had 14,000 special forces, troops under his command. He was head of US Army Special Forces. So obviously we talked about that. At the end of our conversation, um, I had realized before that he had not given a testimony to the Shoah Foundation because obviously I checked, like I did with Helen Collin, and he was nowhere to be found. So I said to him, Sid, it's been wonderful meeting you. Um, I would love to have the opportunity to take your testimony for the Shoah Foundation. Now, I just want to just check in with about this gentleman. Um, I have never had the ability, ever had the opportunity to meet somebody as courageous as Sid Shacknow. This is his um, dress uniform. Um, on there are three silver stars, Vietnam, and two bronze stars. One a highly, highly decorated um, soldier with valor like you've never seen in your life. And um, Sid said to me, Stephen, you know, it doesn't take very much courage to have 14,000 armed killers under your command. He said, you're pretty well protected. So he said, I had no fear going into the Soviet Union. He said, that didn't, didn't cost me anything from a, a courage point of view. He said, but I have to tell you that I do not have the courage to sit in front of your camera and tell my story. I said, okay, well, look, here's my card. If you ever change your mind, let me know. It's been lovely meeting you. Goodbye. Six months later, I get an email. It was a very short email, kind of military. It just said, hi, Steve. I'm ready. Sit. <laughs> so I went to Fort Hood, and, you know, he got a very typical Jewish home. There were a lot of photographs all around him, except every single one of his daughters was in uniform. Two major generals, son-in-laws, and two, two daughters who were generals in the USA, US Army. Um, a, a man of tremendous service. And in his testimony, he, he told me things that I had really never heard, but one of the most important ones was this. He said, when my father left the ghetto, supposedly to go and join the partisans, and left his family behind, I knew that he was really a coward. And I vowed that I would never, ever be a coward and leave others to fend for themselves. I went into a, an antiquarian bookshop. Um, it was in the United Kingdom in the city of Lincoln. Um, and um, I had my three kids with me, they were all little kids at the time. And we went in there to look for, I don't know what it was, Ina Blyton or something. And I see a spine of a book, and it says, The Extermination of Germany's Jews. 
Okay, so I'm a Holocaust scholar, and I see that. What do I do? I, I leave the Enid Blyton section, and I grab that. I grab the book, which is obviously about the Holocaust. I see it at the front cover, and it says, The Yellow Spot, The Extermination of Jews in Germany. I pay the 10 pounds, I put it in the bag, and I go back to buying the kids' books. Go home, I don't do very, do very much with it. I just stick it alongside all the other hundreds of books I've got on the Holocaust on my bookshelf. Didn't open it until several months later. I was looking for some. I find the book. Oh, I'll have a look at that. I open the cover, and to my surprise, the date of publication for this book was 1936. The Extermination of the Jews of Germany published by Victor Gollant in London, 1936. What I found in that 285 pages was um, a, a study of what had happened in Germany from January the 1st, 1935, up until the Nuremberg Laws of September 19, sorry, January 1933, when Hitler came to power, up until September 1935, when the Nuremberg Laws were published. And they kind of drew a line under it and got it published at that point. Because they had drawn the conclusion, the authors, that there was no possible outcome other than the extermination of the Jews of Germany. And then we say we didn't know. Why didn't we know? It's because we weren't actually listening to the people that could tell us what we needed to know, including this rabbi here. They interviewed people, Jewish people, in 1935 about what they were experiencing and they knew of course they knew because their lives were being completely collapsed and exploded by what was happening around them they knew it was completely untenable to continue to live in germany or that their lives would, would have any future at all and the only conclusion could be drawn was there's no way this community can continue to exist Those people, when we talk about the courage to speak, were risking their lives to be able to give us this data, and we didn't listen to this data. Today we would call it data. This information, their lives, what was happening to them, and had we listened to what they were saying, then we might have drawn the same conclusion, we being our forebears. Were we listening? I don't know that we were listening. You know, there's a, a lovely film out at the moment, you might have seen it already, um, that was done by Roberta Grossman, um, based on the book by Sam Cassow called Who Will Write Our History, about the Onyx Shabbos, the Onyx Shabbat archive in the Warsaw Ghetto. This group of people knowingly risk their lives every single day to make sure that we could know what we know today about the Holocaust. Because they knew that even though their lives, at that point in time, it was clear that there was going to be a very near end point to most of their lives, they saw the importance of documenting history, but it's much more than that. It's about the future. Garen, when you talked about Elange a few moments ago, it reminded me of these people here that they were not going to be able to tell their children and their grandchildren anything. They were not going to pass their heritage down because their children and their grandchildren were going to die with them, but they knew that their story really mattered for the future. And so they risked their lives to put these diaries and these letters and, and the documents and everything into into storage so that we could today sit here and know what happened from the inside out. Why is this important to know? It's important to know because perpetrators are not only killing people, they are absolutely determined, and the Nazis were absolutely determined not only to wipe out the Jews, but every trace of their existence and their lives and their, re their history and their, their, their language and their community, but also to ensure that that history never made its way into this room or into your center here. To make sure that they had the final word on their own perpetration. Thankfully they failed because of the courage the amazing courage of these people, most of whom did not survive. Not only them, but also um, many 
I mean, many victims during the Holocaust were aware of what was going to happen after them. But this book here, Amidst the Nightmare of Crime, which contains actually five stories from the Zonderkommando in Auschwitz, um, was written um, with the purpose of ensuring that they knew that there was going to be history after the Nazis. They knew that ultimately evil does not succeed, but would the story be told? And so they, again, risked their lives not that there was much to risk at that point when you're in the Zonder Commando. However, they found the way to make sure that we know that story in their words. It all points to the issue of testimony, which is obviously I'm coming to, and the power of testimony. Now, there's another Stephen who works in our organization. Um, he was the founder of our organization, and it all began right here. Now, when they make movies, so I'm sure those of you in the movie business will know, but I didn't really know this originally. They don't film them in sequence, they film them out of sequence. So the very first day that Steven Spielberg was shooting Schindler's List, he was right here at the, um, the gates of Auschwitz-Birkenau. It appears later in the movie, but this was their first day of filming. And there he is with Liam Neeson, and they're actually, um, I don't know if you know this, but when they filmed it, they didn't film inside the camp because that wasn't allowed to do that. So they rebuilt a mirror image of the camp on the outside. So when people turned up to go to Auschwitz-Birkenau in that time in 1993 when they were filming, what they found was a camp outside the camp and a camp inside, and the original camp inside the camp. Most movie sets are closed. Stephen always runs a closed movie set, except on this occasion. He said, if Holocaust survivors come to the set and want to know what's going on, please invite them onto the set so we can talk to them and show them what's happening. And of course, this is 1993, so families are starting to return a little bit more frequency to Eastern Europe and to find their roots and take their, you know, their children to where, and their grandchildren to where they had been. And one day on this um, set, um, a lady, actually on the first day of the set, a lady came to Mr. Spielberg and she was, he was talking about the dogs you can see there, and the uniforms, and the, um, you know, the trains, and so forth. And she said to him, Mr. Spielberg, stop for a moment. Um, I don't want to talk to you about this one day in my life. You know, I had a life before I got to Auschwitz, and I had a life after I got, well, left this place. I want to tell you my whole story. In the uh, car that evening, going back to Krakow, um, Stephen was speaking with his producer, one of his producers. Uh, Branko Lustig, who was also a survivor of Auschwitz. And he said to Branko, what would it be like to give the chance for every survivor to tell their story? And that's how the show Foundation was born. So here we are, um, 25 years later. Um, we've now filmed in 65 countries. Uh, we've got 55,000 testimonies and in 43 languages. Now, when, it looks on, when you see it on the screen, it doesn't look like a big number, but let me just tell you. 55,000 testimonies is about 115,000 hours. So I'm going to invite you, after the talk tonight, to stay and just watch the video archive with me. Um, it will take us 13 and a half years, <laughs> with no breaks. Um, and in fact, let's just say, for example, we're now based at the University of Southern California. Let's just say in May, when we have our graduation, we, we hire one of the new graduates from the Shoah Foundation, and, She's 22 and she's very excited to start at the Shell Foundation and she comes to me or to Dr. Street and says, so um, what would you like me to do? We'll let, we'll let you give us the order. And Corey says, um, what I'd like you to do is just sit and watch the archive um, during the day while you're at work and come back and tell me when you're done. That 22-year-old going to work for 40 hours a week and taking vacations and breaks will be 75 when she comes back to Corey and says, what do you want me to do next, Moss? <laughs> it's literally a lifetime, a full lifetime of testimony. So we've been trying to figure out what to do with this. Um, whoops, that was, that's on automatic. Uh, we've been trying to figure out what to do with this because obviously if you have 113,000 hours, 15,000 hours of content, you can't come in and just find something about a topic um, and watch it all the way through to find it. So what we did, in fact, those 120 people did chop it up into one minute pieces and indexed every single minute. So now you can find the subject matter. So if I'm looking for something on Kristallnacht, I could just find something by typing that word in and... There was a knock at the door. And it was not usual, you know, for people to knock. And I put the um, Gestapo in civvies. Where's your father? 
no idea. He, I said, uh, he is not here, and you know, I had to open. And I remember the chutzpah, show me your IDs. <laughs> I said to them, I was 11, 10 years old, 11 years old, show me your IDs. And these guys pushed some kind of badge through the slit, and then of course I had to let them in. And they looked, and they went, we had feather beds in the bath, in the bedrooms, and it was winter, it was a very cold winter that year. And they went into the bedroom and uh, took out knives and slit the feather beds. And I remember saying, are you expecting my father to be hiding in the bed? I mean, I don't know where the chutzpah came from. And they shoved me around and said, you shut up. And uh, anyway, they obviously, I don't know what they were looking for. And then they left, and I tried to push the feathers back into the bed. Then eventually my mother came back and said, Eric, my cousin, and my uncle had been taken to the concentration camp. And we've just been doing a little bit of a work around the term Kristallnacht. And uh, those of you that watch the very good, uh, or follow the very good um, Australian originated platform The Conversation. If you're not signed up to it, it's worth signing up to. And there was a very good article today by one of our colleagues from the Shoah Foundation, Wolf Gruner, who's been looking at Kristallnacht clips like this and has just done a, a really interesting uh, paper uh, article in The Conversation today about the fact that when we see Kristallnacht, very often we see it from the outside. We didn't this evening because of Philip's wonderful work and, and Robbie's wonderful work putting the testimonies together. But very often we see it, the boilerplate of this is what the Nazis did. You know, 91 people were murdered, 237 synagogues, we saw that a few moments ago. 15,000 men in concentration camps. But actually that's what the perpetrators did. The question is, what did people go through? And what we see here with this lady is not only is she describing what was happening on the inside of the house, we learned something very interesting. This 10 year old, faces down the Nazis. Like, show me your ID. You're not coming in until you show me your ID. And then, what are you doing with our feather beds? These very small nuances are extremely important for us to know about because what they show us is what the world was like for those who were going through it, not the ones who were perpetrating it. Our world tells the story usually of, of violence and war and perpetration through the eyes of the perpetrators. Have you ever watched a Holocaust documentary? Guess what? Everything that you see, mainly in those documentaries, was shot with German cameras for their benefit. So we really only ever get their view of it. Testimony allows us on the inside of this, it allows us not only to, the fact that the courage of giving the testimony, but what we learn is these individuals, even at 10 years old, were living through this experience. And they weren't victims, they were human beings that were living in spite of all the circumstances they were going through. And so inadvertently, because of the power of the perpetrator, what we tend to do is give them the, give them the voice rather than the voice of the, the, the victim or the survivor in the case of those who gave testimony. And there's purpose behind this. There's a reason why we have this testimony and the survivors themselves know why they're giving it. Let's go to um, Eva Slonim, shall we, and see what we she has Jews, to say. having lived through the most tragic happenings in the history of the world, it is incumbent on us to be the spokesman for all suppressed and oppressed and be in the forefront of giving our voice to those people and in, uh, in order to help preventing further tragedies. So one of the things that I found at the Show Foundation when we were trying to think about, so what's the future of our archive? We were thinking of thinking about how we would introduce testimonies of genocides other than the Holocaust. Before doing that though, we went to the archive itself to say, what do Holocaust survivors say about that? So we surveyed a thousand testimonies along, along one particular keyword. And the keyword was future, oh, was two words, future message. Every survivor that we interviewed, we asked them, what is your message for the future? And we decided to look at that key word because want, I wanted to find out what do they really think this is about in the long term and found two very interesting tracks. The first is absolutely about memory and history, the importance of passing on the memory, Elenj, to next generations. No question about that. There was also Janabi in there, Garen. 
Why? Because on an equal basis they were saying, and it's extremely important that our testimonies are used to bring people together, to fight evil, to ensure that we don't have identity-based hatred, as our chairperson uh, Lee Lieberman often says, to ensure that we work together and, and that our stories are used for the betterment of humanity. It's absolutely explicit in what they say over and over and over again. You know, one of the most telling things about this archive is that I've watched probably thousands uh, and interviewed hundreds of Holocaust survivors. I have heard anger and I have heard bitterness and I've definitely heard trauma. I have never heard hatred. I have never heard revenge. I remember a teacher once coming to me after a, a particular session and a Holocaust survivor by the name of Eric Hirsch had been describing to the young people about the fact that 86 members of his family had been murdered during the Holocaust. And he made a very strong statement about the lack of justice. And the teacher came up to me and said, you know, I wonder if you, think you could talk to Mr. Hirsch about toning it down a little bit. Um, you know, we don't want the students to get the wrong idea that, you know, you've got to be forceful in getting what you want. I said, wait a minute. Have you ever, have you lost anybody in your family to a murder, like a regular murder on a regular street in Britain? And he said, well, no. I said, so let's just say just one member of your family was murdered. What would you be doing about that right now? He said, well, I would be pursuing justice. And so let's just say that the police department did absolutely nothing. And let's just say there was no trial, and there was no interest in pursuing justice for your murdered family member. How would you feel about that? He said, well, pretty angry. I said, okay, then let's times that by 86. And the fact that you're completely alone in this world. And then you stand up in front of these young people and you encourage them to seek justice in this world. And you encourage them to work together in this world. You want me to tone that down? He said, no, I don't want you to tone it down. I said, that's good. <laughs> if you look at the Show Foundation archive today, um, 53,000 testimonies are actually given by Holocaust survivors and witnesses to the Holocaust, but there's about 2,500 that are from genocides other than the Holocaust. And it looks a little bit more like this. These are all residents of Los Angeles, actually. Dario Gabay in the middle there is probably the last surviving member of the Zonda Commando that I know of in the world today. There may be somebody else. Um, he worked in Crematorium 3 at Auschwitz-Birkenau and lives in Los Angeles today, age 96. Um, the other four ladies um, from Armenia and Rwanda and Cambodia and Guatemala. Um, was that Janabi? Coming together to tell the human story. Even though, even what I say cannot probably be comprehended, but it's still, um, it's incumbent on us as the last survivors to the Holocaust, as the last witnesses to the Holocaust, to, uh, to, to recount and to perpetuate and to let the world know and the next the future the generations know and to charge them with the responsibility of making sure that this tragedy would never happen again. And I would like to say on a lighter note that, that we should not only we should not only bemoan what happened, but we should also celebrate survival and the in, indomitable spirit and, and um, tenacity of the Jewish people. But specifically, this story must be told as a warning to all mankind. Uh, 1915, uh, there was a young man in the um, German medical corps in Anatolia, part of the Ottoman Empire, in an area today would be Armenia or close to Armenia. He was a pacifist, um, and so he had chosen not to bear arms, and therefore he was in a medical group. 
He had been hearing about what had been happening to the Armenian people. There was a very strict rule that no photography was allowed because it's always the case that perpetrators try and close down communication because they always work in darkness. But he took his little camera out at the weekends um, and he photographed what he saw happening around him. Men, women and children being driven into the desert, being hanged, being killed, dying of starvation and disease. Ooh. He was caught with his camera um, and sent back to Germany, but not before he took the film out and put it in the back of his aluminium belt. They had big buckles. And he put the film in the back of the buckle, went back to Germany. Um, 1933, the 1st of April, um, there was the first anti-Jewish boycott. It looked a little bit like this, some of the scenes not dissimilar to Kristallnacht. Um, don't buy from Jews being the thing that was said. That evening, a journalist sat down and he wrote a letter to Adolf Hitler. Six pages, beautifully written prose. He sent it as an open letter. And it basically says, what you did to the Jews of Germany today, you did to me as a German. And every open-minded, free-thinking, liberal German, liberal Democrat in Germany, we're going to speak out and we're going to say in our name, stop. He didn't know that evening that he was the only person among 60 million people that took the time and trouble or had the inclination to say that. The same journalist actually had written a book about two, day, two years previous, uh, no, sorry, 1924, um, the same year that Mein Kampf came out, um, and it was about, it was called Five Fingers Over You. And what he'd worked out was the totalitarian regime that has emerged in the Soviet Union was not going to be good for civilians. And so he took a train from Odessa to Moscow and he kept a diary, and he turned that diary into a novel. It was on the bestsellers list with Mein Kampf in 1924. Um, he didn't so, do so well out of his um, open letter. He was sent to Dachau concentration camp and, and then subsequently several other concentration camps before actually being released and living out the war in Italy and partly in England. So um, I was in Jerusalem at Yad Vashem in the early 1990s and um, I knew, actually, about the letter from Hit to Hitler. And one day I was going through the, um, the Jewish quarter of um, Jerusalem and I was with a friend of mine from Germany, her name was Anna Gret. We were going round a little Armenian quarter and in the Armenian quarter was a little museum. We wandered in there and we're looking at the pictures of the Armenian genocide and I see on the, the, the subtitles, A. Wegner, A. Wegner, A. Wegner. The same camera had taken all the pictures in the museum. So I turned to her and I said, that's not Armin Wegner, is it? She said, oh yeah, that's Armin Wegner. Armin Wegner, the same person that had taken the photographs in the Armenian genocide, was the same person that wrote the book about what would become Stalinist Soviet Union and what would happen under Stalin, and was the same person that wrote the letter to Hitler that said, stop in my name, and became one of the first inmates of the concentration camp system. There are 26,500 people who've been awarded Righteous Among the Nations by Yad Vashem and the State of Israel. Every single one of them has met the criteria of rescuing at least one Jewish person at the risk of their life, except for one. Armin Wegner never rescued a single Jewish person. And they made the exception because he's also the only known person among 60 million Germans to say, in my name, stop. So um, we were thinking about expanding the archive of the Shoah Foundation to, co to, con to contain other genocides other than the Holocaust. And I was speaking to um, a, um, a filmmaker in Los Angeles, his name was Michael Hogopian, um, about the fact that he collected about 400 testimonies of the Armenian genocide on 16mm over the years. He was a documentary filmmaker, he would put in a, a bid to go and make a film about the Nile. So he was sailing down the Nile, knowing that along the Nile were all these little Armenian communities in diaspora. And at the end of the day, he'd film the herons and whatever, the boats. He would do it very sparingly so that he had a reel of film left. And at the evening, he would go and find a genocide survivor and sit and say, tell me your story. 
collected 400 of them. So I was asking him about where the inspiration came to do that. And he said, well, I met this guy and he came to my home and he said, Michael, you're a, a filmmaker. Um, you should really, you know, the, the survivors of the Armenian genocide are not going to be here much longer. Really, you, if you could just use your talent and your gift to, to make sure the stories are told. I said, who was that? He said, oh, it's some German guy. You wouldn't know him. I said, German guy? He said, yeah, his name was Armin Wegner. I said to him, you didn't have the presence of mind to film him, did you? He said, oh yeah, he was my first interviewee. And so the Sheriff Foundation now has this beautiful testament. I, I came in Turkey as a member of the German Red Cross. And in this quality, I came through the whole desert of Mesopotamia and was a witness of the terrible persecution of the poor Armenian people and saw the terrible sacrifice. A, a witness is a very difficult task. I could never more forget what I have seen. I was always willing to speak of this terrible thing and to say to the peoples, don't care that not a second time the same terrible thing can repeat. Armin Wegner is one of the heroes of the 20th century because he never succeeded at what he was trying to do, not once. But he absolutely never stopped trying and he had the courage to use his voice every single time. This is uh, Margina Begon. She was the first person that I met in Bangladesh. She's Rohingya. She had arrived from Myanmar uh, two days before this photograph was taken. She had two boys aged, I think, four and three, and she was eight months pregnant. Her husband had tried to help her and the children escape, but he was shot in the back as he ran into the forest down to the river. So on this little piece of paper here, you see I can just, I'm just scribbling away as I'm meeting these people. It became very clear to me that if this was the pattern, somewhere in the region of 1.5 family members per family would have been murdered in the previous six weeks to the, when this photograph was taken in um, October of 2017. And so um, I sat and talked. It's interesting because I was walking through the refugee camp and I heard what sounded like a primary school. And it's really strange because I'd never been in the Warsaw Ghetto or any ghetto for that matter, but I heard about these stories about these schools and how parents kept their children going and how they, you know, we, we call it spiritual resistance, but really the tenacity, the resilience to keep going. And I, I'm in a refugee camp, in a part of this camp that's been there about a week, and I hear a primary school. So, okay, I've got to find out. I can climb up the bank and end up inside this tent here. It's actually a madrasa. They'd thrown it up in a matter of days. And um, this is Imam Sadiq. He's not the Imam of this congregation because what happens is when you show up at a refugee camp when you've just fled, you know, fled for your life, um, you turn up there and they just put you on a list and then you're just on the list next to the family next to you. So it's like, okay, number 100 to 200, you're now going to go to block 215C, whatever it is. This person's going to take you there, off you go. Anybody who's got the number 100 to 200, there you go. He lands there, he's the only one that's an imam, so he becomes the instant imam of this community, this 100 people who he's never met before, all of whom have had family members killed in the last six weeks and are highly traumatized. I've interviewed a lot of people about genocide. I don't think I've interviewed anybody as um, traumatized as um, Hamwal Sadek. You can see in his eyes there. Um, he was in his mosque. He was taken out of his mosque 
It was burned. His books were burned. He was taken away to be tortured for four days. He survived that and was relieved to survive it. Went back to his family to find out that his wife had been gang raped in front of the community while he had been away. So he takes his wife and his two little children and he decides he's going to leave that day. And he leaves his 15 and 16 year old with his brother, their uncle, to help organize things because they're all going to try and get out of there. But he's going to protect his wife right now and he's going to get her out of there with the two little kiddies. So he runs. When the militia came back and found out that he's gone, they killed his 15 year old and 16 year old. So by the time his brother turns up two weeks later in Bangladesh, there are no boys. That was about four weeks before this photograph was taken. Um, I'm going to just play you a little clip. I asked him to give a, a little clip to say if he wanted to share something with the world, what would it be? This is what he said. <laughs> Recognize that. If I'm going to face death for it, so be it. Because his life, just like Helen Collins, at that point, the immediacy of his life was death. Now, this wasn't 1945, this is 2017. You'll notice in this picture, the man sitting behind him, Sultan. These people had never told each other their stories. They weren't sitting around the campfire at night swapping stories. They were just dealing with their own trauma and their own difficulties. But once Imam Sadiq had spoken, then Solomon was in front of the camera. Once Solomon had spoken, and it went on like this, and they all listened to each other. This is Anwar Sadiq's wife, who also told us her story, and his two little boys. Um, ten days ago, I was in northern Iraq at a refugee camp called Badarash. This refugee camp had been there for a week, two weeks ago. Um, it was put up because the President of the United States made a telephone call to the President of Turkey, which meant that several hundred thousand people left their homes and 2, 5,000 of them turned up here. I went there because a little bit like the yellow spot, um, I wanted to listen to what people had to say about what was happening because that phone call was not about a military solution, it was about a particular solution that the President of Turkey had, which has, which involves ensuring that there are no Kurds living in that safety zone. That is called ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing is not a technical or even a legal term, but it is a term which helps us to understand that if we have an end game, which is the removal of people from a particular place, we have to take that seriously. I hope that the people at the Shoah Foundation are interviewing right now, this week, in Badarash and on the border of um, Syria and North Kurdistan, never have to be used because I hope that what they're sharing with us right now doesn't actually end up in violence and genocide. I hope that they're able to find a way to do that without, to, to find their lives again without violence. But I stood there and I asked the stupid question, so why did you leave your home? Well, because they were shelling it, you might think the answer was. And I said, okay, so why did you really leave your home? Well, because there is no way that we can live in that territory with the Turkish military there because our lives are in danger. I spoke to um, a number of people. Let me just give you a little introduction to one of them and to see what he said. برای برای متوسط لبه تنها به گرگونی تا ترکیه است لبه تنها به افتشتی که در باستان کرد سرچ چاوی می‌بینیم تنها که یعنی حتی گیاه و آستا گذر ایریش پیرکات کنن زیر و مالی واجبات سین و پیرکاش فرد بود که چه سلامتی ترکیه بین و ترکیه چه سلامتی بین سوری سوری نه سوری سوری نکار به حفظی حدی خلیم بری ترکان نکار این فبروری از 2017 یس 
14th of February, there was an attack on a, a free speech event in Copenhagen, followed by an attack on a synagogue. One of a series of violent attacks against Jewish property and people that have taken place around the world. And the Show Foundation is collecting testimony from people that have experienced anti-Semitism now. You see, there is no such thing as anti-Semitism which is not at the core of its DNA genocidal. How do we know that? Because we already have evidence that if you leave anti-Semitism unchecked, it can and may result in the mass murder of Jewish people. We have that warning from history so clearly emblazoned. Now, I know everybody in this room is conscious of that. But we did a survey and we found out there was lots of data and there were lots of research projects and there was lots of advocacy and lots of lobbying and lots of fear and lots of concern. Um, but a little bit like in the yellow spot situation, it seemed that no one was actually talking to the people that had experienced anti-Semitism, except to get data. So we said, okay, let's maybe use the Show Foundation to help them tell their story. Um, this is Meta Bentau. She was the mother that was throwing the bat mitzvah party that evening when the gunman came into the synagogue. She was just a woman who had a, 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 an administrative job and three kids at home and was throwing a party and was dancing when the gunman arrived. Um, Curry Street went and she interviewed 10 people from that synagogue, including Meta, um, a couple of months after. Let's just hear what she said. In the weeks after, we received emails and phone calls and letters from people all over the world, Jews, non-Jews, Muslims, writing especially to Hannah, saying that nothing should take away, no heinous act should take away what was her great day. This great outpour of uh, comfort and support, and that was wonderful. Unfortunately, I also received and read and saw comments about how we brought this upon ourselves. Nidal was also interviewed as a part of that um, program. Um, the morning of the, uh, after the shooting, it was his wife's birthday and they were going to have a party. He cancelled the party and he said, you know, we shouldn't be celebrating on a day like this. Let's go to the synagogue. And they went to the synagogue and they took flowers. Um, it, they're obviously a um, practicing Muslim family. Nidal, actually, his grandparents live in Ramallah on the West Bank. He's grown up in a Palestinian family. And they went and they put, took flowers to the synagogue. And he describes the fact that he got that down there. He was a little uh, uncertain about doing that. And what happened was somebody came out of the synagogue wearing a yarmulke. And there's about seven people in Copenhagen wearing a yarmulke. So we could probably find out who that person was. And went up to him and said, thank you for being here. It means a great deal that you've come here. He, Nidal was completely surprised by this, went back and was telling his friends on Facebook, you wouldn't believe it, these Jewish people said thank you to me for going to the synagogue. And out of that act of gratitude, what do we call it again? Um, Janami? Coming together of Jews and Muslims in that place of death and murder and trauma, this young man decided he was going to do a peace ring around the, the synagogue. So he went to the police to get a permit to do a, se a peace ring and they said, absolutely no way. It's a crime scene, you can't bring a bunch of Muslims down here right now, it would be inappropriate, sorry. Come back later. So he then found that the Jewish Film Festival was being cancelled, so he called the, the head of the Jewish Film Festival and said, can I do something to help? She said, well, do you want to see a movie? So he said, okay, for every Muslim person I bring, if you can find a Jewish person, Let's go, to, let's go and see a movie together. So he walks in there, he's Palestinian, and I don't know exactly which movie it was, but it was about the founding of the State of Israel. And he says, you know, I walked in there, and always for me, Israel was the enemy. He said, I walked out of that movie, and I was a Zionist. <laughs> he then did his, he did his peace ring a week, a week later. I share this story with you because it took great courage, first of all, for these people to tell their stories. But what we found is, when we listened to their stories, we found something completely different to what you've seen on the news cycle. And the people most affected by it were traumatized, but not fearful. They were working on what to do about the situation. In fact, they didn't, the glaring headlines were not what we saw. We saw 
ordinary people rebuilding their lives, doing amazing things together, like this person, Nidal. I'll just give you one little minute and we get a flavor of him. Uh, Anti-Semitism has been growing. Uh, I realize that <clears throat> more than anything um, in uh, this year in February, when the attack took place uh, in Copenhagen, I think when it's right next to you, all of a sudden you kind of you, you have to think about what's going on. Um, it's no longer something happening somewhere else. Uh, so um, it's you and you have to be take part of it. Um, and that's when I start to understand that uh, Jews that live in Denmark or Jews that live in European countries, uh, they have a reason to be afraid. We're living in um, extremely difficult times. But one of the things that I'm finding so amazing as um, the cust current custodian of the Shoah Foundation archive is that these individuals who gave us their testimony have given us everything we need to know what to do in these times. You know, very recently somebody came into our office and was talking and we're having a conversation and a question was put to one of my colleagues like, well, what makes you feel so, you know, success in your job? And she said, you know, in these, these days it makes it quite difficult to feel successful. I listened to that and I thought, you know, that's not the right answer. Because actually, we have been given um, foresight, we have been given insight. When survivors tell us their stories, it's not about the history of their lives. The history is important. What's really important is what they're really telling us in those words. It's about family and trust and tenacity and resilience and resistance. It's about seeing through circumstances, seeing on the other side of what's happening. Those people who did the Arnek Shabbos uh, archive, they knew they weren't going to survive, but they knew there was a future, and they were planning for that future, and they were making sure that they were part of it. The people who have given us their testimonies, as our chairperson at the Shoah Foundation keeps telling us, it has to be there for millennia. 60,000 years, Garen, 60,000 years of wisdom and knowledge here in this particular community of which, we are, of which we are part today. We have thousands of years ahead of us. So what we need to do is we need to see this archive. I often talk about this of testimony um, as being the final word. If you think about it, Hitler intended that Jews would not exist and that their memory would be wiped out forever, that there would be no story of the Holocaust, that we would not hear these voices and know what happened on the inside of those houses. He intended to wipe out up for all time and create a museum and, lock the, and basically put that history in the past. And because of the voices and the courage of the survivors that have given us their testimony, we now, they have the final word on the Holocaust. Question is, are we listening to them? Really? Are we actually taking time to sit with their testimonies to say, what does this mean? What does it mean to me and my family and my community? Or are we just putting it into, the, into shelves and keeping it there and creating memorials? I urge you, Go to your Holocaust Center and listen to those voices as individuals. Never think that you know it all, however close you are to it. Listen to the voices of the survivors of genocide other than the Holocaust. Because we don't compare them, we're all part of a shared humanity. We have a shared story to tell. The Jews of Europe were not looking for other Jewish people to come to their assistance during the Second World War and during the Holocaust. What they needed were voices of people who cared about humanity, irrespective of whether they were Jews or they were Muslims, whoever they were, who were prepared, like Armin Wegner, to stand up and say, stop. Not because it affects me, but because it affects us. Every day I go to the Shoah Foundation, I am deeply, deeply grateful to learn and to listen and I want to say to every survivor here and to those of you who are children of survivors and uh, for the um, for the Goldman and Rosencrantz families tonight for making this evening possible um, because the story of your families um, are safe with us with the Holocaust Center and with the Shoah Foundation but they will have no meaning unless we take them into our future and listen to them as they were intended to be thank you Thank you, Stephen. Very hard to follow Stephen Smith, but um, we're going to do candle lighting. It's a tradition at our events to light six candles in memory of those who were murdered during the Holocaust. We invite candle lighters to do this honour as representatives of different communities. 
So first of all, representing Holocaust survivors, I'm going to call on David Prince. David Prince was put on the last transport with his family from the Lodge Ghetto to Auschwitz. His mother was taken and never seen again. David's been a volunteer guide at the Jewish Holocaust Centre since 1995, sharing his story with tens of thousands of students. Thank you. Representing the child survivors of the Holocaust, I call on John Lamovi. John Lamovi survived the Holocaust by hiding his Jewish identity and also physically hiding with various people. Most of his extended family were murdered in concentration camps. John has been a volunteer guide at the Jewish Holocaust Centre since 1995 also sharing his story with countless students. Representing the third generation, I call on Natalie Herskew. Natalie Herskew is the Innovation Manager at Launchpad, an organisation that provides opportunities for entrepreneurship, activism and collaboration in the community. Natalie spearheaded Launchpad's Regeneration Group, a group of third generation descendants of Holocaust survivors who create engaging conversations about what it means to be part of Gen 3 today. Representing the righteous among the nations, non-Jews who save Jews, I call on Carl Eustra. Kyle is the grandson of Dutch couple Elizabeth and Idz Eustra, who at great risk to their own lives rescued a Jewish baby who was about to be deported to his death. They later brought him up as their own while ensuring the links to his Jewish heritage remain tangible. Representing Indigenous Australia, I call on Shane Bates Gilby. Shane is a proud Indigenous woman inspired by the legacy of Yorta Yorta leader William Cooper. She recently completed, completed an undergraduate degree at Monash Uni. She was the recipient of the Wilson Family Scholarship this year. This scholarship was created in conjunction with the Jewish Holocaust Centre to offer assistance to Indigenous university students. And representing LGBTIQA+, I call on Julie Leader. Julie's grandfather was murdered in Auschwitz in January 1943 after her father's family had moved to Brussels where they thought they would be safe. Julie's father, Herbert Leder, contributed to the photography at the archives at the Jewish Holocaust Centre from 1992 to 2001. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to be extending the vote of thanks this evening. And I can recall back in 2008 when I attended the inaugural Shmuel and Betty Rosencrantz oration, created in memory of Betty Rosencrantz Zichron Lebracha, and to honour now the legacy of Shmuel Zichron Lebracha as the second president of the Jewish Holocaust Centre. And I'm delighted to be here this evening attending the 11th one. It's truly an important part of the Jewish Holocaust Centre calendar. And we wish to acknowledge the outstanding support of the Goldman family to Leon, Judy Zichron Lebracha, their daughter Terry, and her husband Jonathan Lazarus, in making this event a special one and ensuring its continuity. Our heartfelt thanks, and indeed, what a fantastic, amazing evening it's turned out to be. And I wish to extend the vote of thanks to all involved in this wonderful event. To Geraint Steele, thank you for your powerful, ev ev evocative welcome to country. I've never heard anything like that one before. Much to think about, much to take home. And once again, it's been, in more ways than one, a most thought-provoking and inspiring one. And tonight, we've been privileged to experience a part of one man's incredible journey. Stephen, you go directly to the coalface and you really alert all of us in the world to unfolding tragedies. 
And yes, we do have to listen to the testimonies. You're not only a leader in the field of preserving and presenting eyewitness testimony, you're also an outstanding human rights campaign, campaigner, recently spending time in northern Iraq with Kurdish refugees, as we saw briefly. It has been confronting and uplifting to have been a passenger tonight, travelling for a time with you on that journey. You are truly an inspiration. Thank you so, so much for being with us and what you do for us and the world. It is said... <laughs> it is said that history never repeats itself, but I think Mark Twain, who was, suggested sometimes it rhymes. And in an article this week in the Australian Jewish News, Stephen, you spoke about Holocaust in slow motion, seemingly indicated by current world events. Again, the treatment of the Kurds. And on this day, as the end of the 81st anniversary of Kristallnacht, we must be aware that the commemoration of this tragic event is a powerful reminder of the importance of confronting anti-Semitism and racism, something that is as relevant today as it was 81 years ago. Shmuel Rosenkranz, was a survivor of Kristallnacht in Vienna and his contribution to Jewish life in Australia, and particularly to the Melbourne Jewish community, is very well known. He served as president of the Jewish Holocaust Centre for 14 years, and his passion for Jewish education, the transmission of Jewish identity, and the perpetuation of Jewish heritage was reflected in his optimism, which never waned. He was a man with European sensibility, with a firm grip on the future, as if evidenced by his vision for our Holocaust Center, which went far beyond the bounds of a museum. And at the Jewish Holocaust Center, we're forever indebted to him for his foresight and his great contribution. I was most fortunate to have worked alongside Shmuel on the board of the Jewish Holocaust Center. He was my mentor, my guide, and my support when I became the center's first woman board member in 1999 and Shmuel's co-president in 2006. Today, when we look at Kristallnacht, we see it often as, a, as that event which heralded the tragedy of the Shoah. I believe that in today's world, it is important for us to focus on acts of decency, acts of kindness, acts which are life-affirming and positive. Is that the, like the Janami that, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, that you're talking about? And people had, like William Cooper, a first Australian elder in a time when he and his people didn't even have the vote and were not even counted in the census, marched to the German consulate from Footscray in 38, December 38 to present a petition against the inhumanity of Kristallna. Of Gerard Herbst, born in Munich, hiding a family there in Munich on Kristallna. He's actually one of the survivors, the interviewed by the Shoah Foundation uh, as a, a righteous, and how we can emulate them, how we can you do, as you said, Gar, it, it, it really sits, it, it's in our power to do something. And in an organisation such as our Holocaust Centre that has evolved in Melbourne over the past 35 years, there are many people engaged in tasks at a multitude of levels. Tonight was a collaborative affair, effort, and I want to thank every one of the who's played a part in this evening's event, to Jane Josem and her team. Thank you for all your efforts. And it's really a very exciting time for us at the centre in our history because we're embarking on major redevelopment to ensure our future. Thank you to all of you who have generously supported us to date and allowed us to get to this place. And I would encourage everyone to, who has not to support us because it's for, not for just us, it's for the entire community and it's especially for future generation. And finally, to all of you who have attended, thank you for making this the most memorable event.